when I first started looking at this painting, I always worked on the idea that it was not by CyberX and that it was by another Dutch artist called Jan Griffier. But I tend to think that it is by CyberX simply because it, of the, well, lots, lots of sort of details. I've looked at other CyberX paintings and tried to think about whether it is by him. And I think it is because, simply because it's much more kind of free and expressive, not just in terms of the architectural details of Nottingham, but in terms of his interest in the surrounding countryside. Um, we don't really know if this was commissioned by anyone in particular. I suspect it wasn't. And I think that one thing we do know is that CyberX spent time at Woolerton Hall here. And he did a, a much more conventional close-up prospect of Woolerton Hall um, in around 1697. And I think that while he was at Woolerton, things with landscape painters like this is that they would be commissioned by uh, an important uh, aristocrat landowner to do a portrait of their house as such, and they would stay there. And because travel was so difficult, they would stay there for several months and do sketches and do all kinds of views of the house. And I think while he was there, while CyberX was at Woolerton, he would think, right, okay, you're working to a commission, so you're doing what the landowner, property owner wants you to do to a certain extent. But while you're there, you also think, I want to do something for myself. So I think this view is taken purely on a speculative basis by Cyrex. He travels out, he starts to wander around the town, he sees the hill and thinks, well, I wonder what it's like up there, I wonder what the view is like from up there. And I think, I think just on a nice summer's day, he goes up there and he sees this view. And I think he thinks, right, let's try and get all of this in. Um, and let's get the sweep of this landscape around it. But also with nods to patrons that he would know of, Duke of Newcastle in the castle, um, the Dukes of Kingston at Pierpont, and, um, and at Woolerton as well. So it's a bit of a speculative thing, but I think it's also about him wanting to become much more of a landscape painter rather than just a painter of houses. But I also think in terms of the, the scene as a whole is that the history of it isn't known, particularly in terms of who owned it or anyone who bought it, simply because it probably didn't get sold, because it's too ambitious. Your patron will look at this and think, why is it all this boring countryside? So I think it probably remained unsold. It's ambitious in its scope. And it's ambitious, I think, simply because he's interested in the kind of everyday rural foreground. Details like the, the barge here going along the river. And essentially, in the 1690s, this is not what your wealthy patron would be interested in. There simply wasn't a precedent for this. It's ambitious because he's exploring the landscape for its own sake and out of his own interest. So for that time and in relation to how English landscape painting develops, it is ambitious because he's interested in the countryside, which mostly people would find to be not just boring, but, but common and dull because it's just working landscapes. So for your patrons, they won't be interested in that. I think it's about kind of exploring ways of painting which kind of gave you more freedom. It's the beginnings almost of this more of a, what we call the kind of pastoral tradition in English painting and in the way we looked at the English countryside. So it's less about the kind of business-like end of it, much more about seeing cows dotted across a meadow and little boats just kind of slowly, calmly, um, quietly wending the way across the Trent, really. It is also about wanting to fit in what he sees and wants to fit it in in a way that compositionally works, and which works in terms of leading the eye in from right to left, sort of down, perhaps naturally towards the town, 
down this lane here, you would look around the town and then your eye would sort of move across and then follow the winding trend beyond. Given, given a landscape like this, you would want to paint the details as accurately, how you then exaggerate or, or expand or compress stuff in terms of making a picture as a whole. It's, you know, it's, it's that typical artist's license. The picture is, the, the, the view, the picture is much more important, creating the picture, than it is about accuracy. First of all, you've got this, this kind of advantageous vantage point. So you can get as much in as possible. But it's, I think the kind of narrative really, not just the kind of composition, but the narrative is in, or beginning to be at least in the painting like this, in the little details of people, you know, wandering along the track. And so what you've got is a narrative not just of a kind of particular um, um, representation of a town in its surrounding countryside, but also, I think, as well, a narrative of trade and of industriousness, but also a narrative, I think, of everyday life in, a, in, in, the, in, in an England that is in itself rapidly changing and developing. A painting like this tells so many different stories, you know, so social, cultural, artistic. It tells stories of agriculture, it tells stories of the geography of the area. And, and I think this is the beauty of paintings like this, in that this, this lovely panorama with so much detail and so much kind of incidental detail, the birds for instance, you can get, you can kind of look at it and make up your own stories in relation to it. Um, and there are lots and lots of stories there, I think, not only to be told, but to be kind of imagined as well.